And with that, I would now like to formally begin today's conference and introduce Tracy Brill. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm pleased to announce our speaker, Dennis Fallon. Dennis Fallon is a Senior Vice President of Insurance Sales and Field Operations, reporting to the company CEO. He is responsible for all insurance sales, including group, self-funded, senior, and individual in offices located in 11 states, serving 32 markets. Most recently, Dennis was the Vice President for all our regions. Prior to Benefit Mall, he was the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for WellPoint's affiliate, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Wisconsin. He also has served as Cigna's Healthcare Regional Vice President of Sales for the entire Southeast United States. Prior to that, he was also President and Chief Sales Officer at Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield in New York City. Dennis resides in Dallas at our corporate headquarters, where he has put 31 years of industry experience to work for Benefit Mall and all his broker partners. I'm pleased to welcome Dennis. Thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, well, enough about me, and let's get on to what we're here to talk about today. And I want to first thank all of the brokers that work with us, as we had our best sales year ever. And as we move forward with all the changes in our mutual client needs, we will be announcing an enhanced renewal support program both locally and centralized within the next week. I want to welcome you all today as we will review the many ongoing topics and issues surrounding the Affordable Care Act and what we can expect in 2016. When 2015 began, much of the discussion surrounded the Supreme Court case of King versus Burwell, specifically referencing the outlay of premium tax credits to qualifying persons in all states with exchanges by the state and those established by the federal government under the Department of Health and Human Services. By early June, the court found the interpretation of eligibility of tax credits to be ambiguous, and it was compatible with the rest of the law. Then the rest of the year was a toss-up. Merger mania among some of the health insurance largest carriers continued focus the repeal or extension of the Affordable Care Act's most contentious provisions, such as small group definition expansion, 30 hours as full-time, medical loss ratios, and the Cadillac tax. Continued pressure of broker commissions, employer preparation and pressure for new reporting requirements, entry of new competitors from the tech startups, aka disruptors. And on the day after the Iowa caucuses, the early posturing among more than a dozen presidential hopefuls. Today, we will address many of these issues and many more. Today's topics are broken down into three broad topics. First, what's happening with the Affordable Care Act from the financial struggles of the co-ops to employer reporting. Although the law is in its final stages, there is still a lot to discuss. Next, we want to spend a few min minutes talking about 2016 legislative initiatives, followed by our final topic, where we'll conclude our webinar with some positive research findings focusing on the future of small employer coverage. Ready? Let's go. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, ACCA, promised change. If change was ACCA's only measure of success, it would have overwhelmingly achieved its goal. Of course, how that change is perceived depends on who is asking the question. More than five years after the ACCA became law, the nation is still nearly equally, equally divided in its support. Let's look at some of the impacts. The uninsured rate has dropped from 13.3% in 2013 to 10.4% currently. Federal and state exchanges attracted almost 10 million enrollees in 2015 with additional growth during the most recent open enrollment period. 86% of exchange participants are receiving $1.7 billion a month of tax credits, giving them access to care, many for the first time. Policies are written on a guaranteed issue basis with pre-existing conditions no longer a deterrent to being insured. And the list goes on. Yet. Despite these successes, critics remain. According to a recent Kaiser Family Foundation tracking poll, 43% of the law are in support, while 41% oppose it. 
9.2% of Americans are still without coverage. Cost sharing in the form of high deductibles and co-pays are keeping participants who are now insured for the first time from seeking care. Overall health care costs have slowed in the past few years, but now are expected to climb in many markets, more than 10% in 2016. Some brokers are leaving or ignoring this side of the insurance and focusing elsewhere. The impact is a gap of trained professionals to assist customers in understanding a very complicated set of options. Going back to the opening slide on the ACA update, the Affordable Care Act, here are a list of updates we'll discuss before we get to the other topics. Small group expansion, open enrollment exchange performance, co-op struggle financially, employer reporting, risk corridors, broker commissions, the Cadillac, the Cadillac tax, and repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Let's discuss small group expansion. In 2016, the definition of a small group was supposed to increase to include up to 100 employees under the original provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Many of you worked with your clients to propose or review early renewal plans to avoid the potential significant premium increases that were expected to occur with this new benefits and rating changes. Fortunately, bipartisan support in both chambers of Congress worked to, protect, to pass the PACE Act, protecting affordable coverage for employees, which was quickly, if not reluctantly, signed by President Obama. The PACE Act repealed the mandated small group expansion of groups of up to 50 employees to groups of up to 100 employees and gives states the flexibility to determine the size of their small group market instead of being forced into a national standard. The responsibility was dele delegated to the state level to determine each definition of a small group and how many moved to maintain their definition at 50 employees. Since the legislation passed in late 2015, each state's insurance departments and carriers had to move quickly to approve plans and rates to match this new definition. This further logged in an already uh, hectic and stressed fourth quarter. Brokers as well as carriers are beginning to seek options for off-cycle changes in support of needed consultative review for their clients. Let's get to open enrollment and exchanges. The third annual open enrollment just concluded for both state exchanges and the federal marketplace. If you recall when the exchanges first launched, it is clear that CMS has come a long way. However, controversy still exists. Prior to November 1st, when the open enrollment began, the Obama administration released their 2016 projections for federal and state-based exchanges with expected overall increase of less than 1 million. This meant by the end of 2016, overall enrollment was expected to level off to 10 million participants or half of the original 20 million projection for 2016 that was assumed by the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. At that time, the administration only expected one in four of the remaining uninsured and then expected to enroll in 2016. Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia M. Burwell was quoted as saying, the remaining uninsured are managing very tight household budget budgets and often unaware they can qualify for taxpayer finance assistance with their premiums. We are still waiting for the final data on this year's open enrollment results for analysis. It appears from early results that the 10 million uh, person estimate may have been easily achieved. Regardless of the outcome, one of the most significant reasons cited by the administration in support of their, their projections was the many of the original assumption by the employers dropping job-based plans for the workers haven't planned out. That is a positive development for many of broker partners and one of them we will discuss later in this webinar. For now, suffice to say that the Secretary's comments supports our position that a robust small group mar market continues to persist. Despite these enrollment successes, there is still much debate as to whether these enrollment flows from the law or from the nation's recovery from recession. 
with more people getting jobs that come with health benefits, the percentage of employers providing coverage did not change significantly over the past year. Nevertheless, the AC has reduced the share of uninsured Americans to about 9% through a combination of private insurance and Medicaid expansion aimed at low-income adults. While many of these successes have come as a result of taxpayer-based subsidies, it's still an historic accomplishment, but things may seem to move in a different direction. First, subsidies for low- and middle-income people are often not sufficient to make coverage truly affordable. Premiums increased by a higher amount in 2016 than in previ previous years, further increasing the cost issue for many. Many of the remaining uninsured are young adults who have never really embraced nor put a high priority on obtaining health insurance. Deductibles and coinsurance among subsidized plans far exceed the premiums that many participants are paying. According to Secretary Burwell, we know that the remaining uninsured have a lot of concerns about whether they can afford coverage. About half have less than $100 in savings. Next, Medicaid expansion has largely come to a standstill. Most states that accepted expanded Medicaid, Medicaid have already done so, and the probability of any remaining states adopting the new law still appears low. Now, according to the New York Times, getting and keeping coverage under Obama's law can be frustrating, especially when it comes to documenting eligibility for benefits. The administration said recently it terminated coverage for some 420,000 people who couldn't document that they were citizens or legal immigrants. In late 2015, nearly 970,000 households had their subsidies, quote, adjusted because of problems documenting their incomes, many of which lost their subsidies completely. As we continue with open enrollment and exchanges, there are more troubles that lie ahead for the viability of this public marketplace. United Healthcare announced in November a cut in its earnings forecast while reporting significant losses as participants in Obama exchanges. Further, they indicated a possible future exit from these exchanges in 2017. The announcement was quickly followed by statements from both Aetna and Anthem affirming that their individual business had performed in line with projections through October. They wanted to reassure investors that Obamacare businesses had not worsened after United Healthcare Group warned of their mounting losses. Anthem CEO Joseph Swedish stated that it remains committed to the exchanges and to continuing our dialogue with policymakers and regulators regarding how we can improve the stability of the individual market. Many believe that United Healthcare was viewed had viewed an opportunity to begin a dialogue with the Obama administration over changes needed in the exchanges, as well as emphasize the need to fully fund the risk card of payments. Now, while United, Anthem, and Aetna account for 25% of the overall exchange enrollment, their experiences are not unique. Centin. Molina Cover Healthcare, Humana, HCSC, Healthcare Services Corporation, Kaiser Permanente, and Cigna have all experienced losses, but mainly in line with projections. In addition, more than half of the nation's co-ops co have collapsed with, with unsustainable losses. While most all other carriers have been the exchange business since the beginning, UHC only started selling on exchanges last year and only have one year experience to show at this point. The pattern of losses continues and worsened during 2015. A recent Goldman Sachs Group analysis of state filings for 30 not-for-profit Blue Cross and Blue Shield insurers, which includes HCSC, found that their overall company-wide results were barely break-even. For the first half of 2015, and that the group would post an aggregate loss for the first full year, the first since the late 1980s. As expected, 
The individual exchanges appear to be a key driver for the faltering corporate results, and the medical loss ratio for the blue insurer's individual business was 99% in the first half of 2015, up from 91% at that point in 2014, and 82% for the first six months of 2013. <clears throat> As the carrier's risk pool stabilized, they will be able to more accurately predict more profitable medical loss ratios and must then convince the regulatory agencies to approve premium rates to reflect a more realistic underwriting results. With 2016 rates being increased by double digits across all markets, we may, may see a more stable financial situation in the short term. However, the bigger risk then becomes affordability, to keep enrollment at an adequate level to spread the underwriting risk. With the future of Obamacare being tied heavily to the success of individual exchanges, what are the key issues to focus on? Well, in 2014, 24 million people were eligible for advanced tax credit, aka subsidies, that can be purchased on individual exchanges. 10 million of these individuals were already enrolled in March 2015 in exchange plans through either their state or federal marketplace. Now, by June of 2015, this number dropped to 8.6 million indicating a significant disenrollment rate. Many are concerned that people are signing up for coverage and dropping it after all immediate health care needs are satisfied. Attracting the remaining subsidy eligible participants are increasingly difficult as policies are still too expensive and cost sharing provisions make it unaffordable even when people actually have coverage. These pricing issues may not be resolved soon. A recent McKinsey report shows an aggregate 2.5 billion loss by carriers in 2014 individual marketplace. Only 36% of health plans showed gains in individual market in 2014, and that was before the risk card payments were cut back as many carriers had these on their financial statements as a receivable. These risk card payments are revenue neutral, so the overall results are not going to be different. Three different, uh, excuse me, three different firms, Avalira Consulting, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Urban Institute have all collaborated on an income study of subsidies. The overarching summary is the poorest are buying ophthalmic care policies, and the vast majority of the rest are not. Even if they are subsidy eligible, only 20% of those earning between 250% and 300% of the poverty level have enrolled so far, with even less success at higher incomes. In the, in the Robert Wood Johnson report, they cite the following as it pertains to the enrollment results. First, many people who shop for the marketplace coverage did not choose a plan as they stated the available options were not affordable. Actuarial values, premium tax credits, and cost sharing reductions are the same among most states, while health care costs and the resulting requirements require premiums vary widely, as we all know. This leads to a disproportionate impact among people across various states. Medicaid expansion and subsidized exchange enrollment among the poorest beneficiaries is the major driver of the Affordable Health Care Act's success. As we continue, while the federal and state exchanges for individual consumers has exhibited moderate success, the shop exchanges have shown complete opposite. To date, more, to date slightly more than 12,000 employer groups can be validated as having enrolled through a shop exchange compared with more than 11.5 million enrolled through individual exchanges. Reasons often cited for lack of enrollment in shop exchanges include Extension that allowed the re-enrollment into existing plans through 2016, also referred to as grandmothering. <clears throat> the inadequacy and confusion of employer tax credits, lack of composite rating, exchanges lack the ability to offer multiple plans among multiple carriers, underwriting and pricing rules inside or outside the exchanges are identical. 
All of these reasons show that there is no true incentive for a small group business employer to use the shop exchanges for their employee benefit needs. In fact, it is commonly known that outside the shop exchanges, employers are often able to find more robust and pricing options through their consultative professional support. But the final obstacle may simply be that the state exchanges must be financially self-sustaining by the end of this year, 2016. Few, if any, are close to being on track to achieve this goal. The main driver, of course, is tepid enrollment. Simply, the underlying infrastructure investments by these exchanges assumed a much greater enrollment to support them. By 2016, by statute, all state-based exchanges must be financially self-sufficient. As independent entities, their income depends on fees imposed on insurers, which is then often passed on to the consumers signing up for health care. However, those fees are entirely contingent on how many people enroll in that particular exchange. Low enrollment invariably means higher cost per subscriber. What happens then? With carriers incurring significant losses and exchanges unable to sustain infrastructure costs, will this be an additional catalyst for Republicans in 2017 to dismantle the President's signature policy? As you have seen, as you have followed our blog on healthcare exchanges, on healthcare exchange, we have discussed how co-ops have continued to struggle financially. More than half of the original 23 co-ops have failed and are in various stages of winding down or in receivership by the CMS and the respective insurance departments. As I'm sure you recall, co-ops were formed on the Affordable Care Act as a compromise when the single-payer advocates were gaining momentum. In the original plan, the government was to provide grants to at least two of these new organizations in each state. As time passed, these grants were changed to loans to keep the overall cost of the Affordable Care Act under its spending limits. As of the end of 2014, only 23 of the potential co-ops were actually formed. While many predicted their demise, the number of closures began to accelerate when the Obama administration announced a shortfall in the risk corridor payments. HHS on October 1st of 2015 announced that it could only afford to pay insurers participating in the federal and state-run exchanges just 12.6% of the nearly $3 billion they were owed under a temporary division of the health care law. Known as risk corridors, it's intended to cushion insurers that end up with sicker customers and bigger medical claims that they had anticipated. Co-ops in particular were heavily dependent on these payments to stabilize their risk pools given their size and relied on the availability of these funds as part of the initial pricing strategy. Now, according to a recent government audit, only one of the 23 co-ops made money in 2014, and, but as a group, lost $376 million. In, to in total, co-ops sell more than 100,000 enrollees short of their projections. In addition to the risk card of payments falling far below projections, these enrollment shortfalls and higher than projected medical claims were too much for many of the co-ops to endure. More than 900 million in initial loans may never get repaid. This money was supposed to last 15 years, which is putting extreme pressure on the Obama administration to exit this failed strategy. According to administration insiders, the debate is whether they cut their losses down or do it later. As brokers, you will, you will be relied on to work on the transition of all impacted members in your respective state and exhibit caution where existing co-ops are still operating. Let's move on to employer reporting. Beginning this year, the employer mandate now extends to all groups with greater than 50 FTEs after being delayed a year. In addition, employers must now make an offer of affordable coverage to 90% of all employees, an increase from 70% in 2015. Now, in previous webinars and blogs, 
We discussed in detail the definition of a full-time employee, look-back periods, common ownership, etc. I urge you to refresh yourself with those definitions, and if you like, we have published a number of marketing pieces on these topics that you, you can request from www.healthcareexchange.com. Many of you have been preparing for this mandate for the past four years, and this is exactly the type of information that your clients are looking for. But new in 2016 is employer reporting. Many of you have been working with your clients of these aspects for this data collection. As a refresher, the Affordable Care Act requires any employer with 50 or more employees to report the cost of health care coverage under an employer-sponsored group health plan on the employee's W-2 forms. Known as the reporting requirement, this provision will affect only 4% of the nation's employers. The other 96% of the employers, those that employ 50 or fewer employees, will not be impacted. In addition, those employers that must comply with the new reporting guidelines also must continue to offer quality coverage. The challenge that is affecting these employers is now the issue of reporting. The U.S. Department of Treasury and the IRS will oversee and administer the employer reporting requirements. While the IRS initially set the effective date to January 1, 2014, the requirement was delayed to January 1, 2015, with the initial report needed to be filed in 2016. The final regulation issued in March 2014 is commonly referred to as Section 6055 and Section 6056 reporting, which refers to the IRS code that it was named for. Let's talk about Section 6055, which requires health insurance issuer, excuse me, health insurance insurers, certain employers, and others that provide minimum essential coverage to individuals must report to the IRS information about the type and period of coverage and furnish information in statements to covered individuals. Section 6056 addresses the reporting requirements for employers who provide coverage to large group health insurance. Section 50, 6056 requires those employers to report to the IRS information about health care coverage, if any, they offer to full-time employees in order to administer the employer's share of responsibility provision under 4980H of the code. Now, back to Section 56, it also requires those employers to furnish related statements to employees that may use to determine whether for each month of the calculated year they may claim on the individual tax returns a premium tax under Section 36B. The regulations provide for a general reporting method and alternative reporting method designs to simplify and reduce the cost of reporting for employers subject to the information reporting requirements under 6056. At this, at this point, I almost feel like shouting out Omaha to just change the play. <laughs> in our last webinar, we explained these forms in detail, and like Benefit Mall has done for the mandate issues, we have published a guide specific to the reporting requirements that you can also get on www.healthcareexchange.com. Benefit Mall also offers its own reporting services under the product name All Compliance, and this coupled with our payroll has been quite attractive in support of all of these requirements. On previous occasions, we've reported that one of the issues that Congress might address post King versus Burwell was a simplification of the employee reporting requirements. This past December, Senators Warner from Virginia and Portman, Ohio, introduced S-1996, the, the Common Sense Reporting Act of 2015. Before the Senate adjourned for its August recess, this is similar to the House Bill H.R. 2712, introduced by Representatives Black, Tennessee, and Thompson of California. Specifically, the legislation addresses the final regulations released last March regarding the reporting requirements under Section 6055 and 6056 that we just discussed. Under these requirements, employers and insurance carriers are required to gather 
numerous pieces of data on a monthly basis and report them annually to the Internal Revenue Service and to individuals. The information report is intended to verify compliance with the individual and employer mandates and administer advanced premium taxes, APTC, and cost-sharing subsidies under the state and federally facilitated insurance exchanges. Unfortunately, the information currently required is unnecessarily complex, complex for employers and individuals and must be reported to the IRS at the end of the tax year, not during the exchange enrollment process when it, provides, when it would provide more clarity on which individuals are eligible for tax credits. The most relevant pieces of the legislation from our perspective would, one, create a voluntary prospective reporting system. This would permit employers to voluntarily report to the IRS general information about their health plan for the current year, which will help increase the accuracy of eligibility determinations for exchange tax credits. Under this bill, state and federally facilitated exchanges will access information securely through a data services hub. Next, streamline the reporting process. This eases reporting burdens for employers who use the voluntary prospective, re prospective reporting system by requiring 6056 reporting statements only for those employees for whom the employer has received notification that the employee or their dependents received an after payroll tax rather than a credit than issuing reporting statements for the entire workforce. Next, modernize transmission of information to the individuals. This allows the electronic submission of employee and enrollee statements rather than requiring this information be reported by paper statements sent through the mail. It will take time for these bills to move through the committee process and, as always, may never become law. However, with bills now in both houses of Congress and with many bipartisan responses, these bills will need to be watched closely. Now, as we, as we continue with employer reporting, the chart you're seeing up on the webinar helps to identify the actual forms that are needing to be completed. Forms 1095B and C and 1094B and C were developed by the IRS to provide a mechanism for health plans and employers to comply with regulations. You can see who is responsible, responsible for the production of each form. Many employers are actively seeking a simple solution to produce reports and include as much data as possible from their existing systems in order to decrease the manual labor needed to comply with these government mandates. Many are finding that their payroll providers has most of the data that is needed. But even when combined with an employer benefits administration system, many still will find that some portion of these forms will require manual input. Benefit Mall's all compliance tool performs the following tasks. Variable employee monitoring, reporting dashboard, affordability, affordability monitoring, dedicated customer service, IRS form reporting, IRS form e-filing, and audit logs. We spoke earlier about risk carders and the, and the impact it's had in the failures of the co-ops. I reference this, the lack of payments under the administration of risk card payments as the reason behind this acceleration of failures. Last October, HHS announced that it could only afford insurers to participate in the federal and state-run exchanges, again, 12.6% of the nearly $3 billion they were owed under this temporary provision of the health care law. These payments were intended to help cushion the insurers that ended up with these sicker customers and bigger medical, medical claims they had anticipated. With the USC announcement about their cut in earnings and possible reluctance to participate in the federal exchange, CMS quickly followed with a memo reiterating the agency's desire to pay out all risk harder payments despite the massive shortfall in the near term. The administration's concern was that the UHC announcement would signal the consumers doubts about the financial stability of the exchanges. The memo stated that if health insurers are still owed money under the risk Carter program for 2016, 
HHS will explore other sources of funding for risk corridor payments. Of course, subject to the availability of appropriations. This includes working with Congress on the necessary funding for outstanding risk corridor payments. This memo simply reiterated what CMS stated when it first announced it would be it would only gain 12.6% of the risk corridor payments for 2014 claims. These funds were anticipated by most carriers as a safety net until the market and premium stabilized while they continue to enroll higher number of numbers of sick and high cost participants. Despite the, the recent assurances by CMS, carriers have still reluctant and have begun to increase the premiums on their products and CMS provided no detail of how they would actually fully fund the car dependence. We'll continue to keep you aware through our blog postings and legislative alerts as we learn more about the future funding opportunities. Let's get to the import, another important topic, broker commissions. The whirlwind surrounding the impact of the Affordable Care Act continues to have an impact on brokers. As 2015 came to a close, a number of health insurance have gone on record stating that they would be reducing broker commissions as they headed into 2016 selling season. As we mentioned a few moments ago, United Healthcare, the nation's largest insurance insurer, sent an email to brokers and agents saying the insurer will stop paying commissions to agents and brokers for affordable health care health plan sales. The email stated in part, although United Healthcare's individual on exchange plans remain available in 34 states marketed for 2016, it has been determined we need to further adjust commissions paid on these products. So effective January 1st, 2016, no commissions will be paid for any new United Healthcare individual on exchange and off exchange of mirror plans and, uh, received on or after the state. Mirror plans are those plans that are identical to on exchange, on exchange plans, same license, benefits, etc., that are required to be offered off exchange. The announcement went on to say that the new policy would not only would not impact Medicare plans or non exchange plans. As one expert noted, the only time I've seen this before is when insurers are inquired by government to sell a product they not particularly want to sell. This was said by Wake Forest University Law Professor Mark Hall, and again, here, this seems consistent with an insurer that no longer wants to sell through these changes, but it's not allowed to withdraw immediately. So it's pushing its commission to zero until it is allowed to exit. In addition, New York's Oscar Health Plan will half its broker commission starting in February of this year. Oscar received a fair amount of positive press as a new kind of health plan after the Affordable Care Act was implemented. An article in Forbes noted, although Oscar will have some of the familiar pillars of the healthcare industry like copays and deductibles for in-person visits, it introduces new elements like free telemedicine, free generic drugs, and online price comparisons. Kevin Zini, co-founder, Notice that the health plans will pioneer a consumer experience, not be a processor of claims with, with the goal of simply guiding individuals through the, the complex health system. Other health plan, plans have been contemplating reducing commissions. Aetna made an announcement that they were eliminating commissions for the small group market, then announced that they were going to reinstate some of these commissions. Health Span in Cleveland made a similar move and many other health plans are contemplating ways to reduce their exposure as well. What is leading to the reduction in commission payment? The answer is simple. Health plans are losing money in the exchange market. United announced that it expects as much as $500 million in losses on the Obamacare plans in 2016. Therefore, as a result, United Healthcare announced plans to reduce offering active qualified gold and silver plans. Health plans are trying to cope with the losses by merging. Anthem agreed to buy Cigna for $48 billion. Aetna struck a $35 billion deal for Humana. And Cedron said it will require Health Net for $6.3 billion. Let's move over to the Cadillac tax. As 2015 came to a close, one of the most significant components 
of the uh, Affordable Care Act that garnered the greatest amount of attention in Washington was the Cadillac tax. As a reminder, all employer-based health plans with annual benefit values more than $10,200 for individuals and $27,500 for families will be subject to a 40% tax for every dollar above those thresholds beginning in 2018. One of the things that became apparent is that not everyone was in favor of this repeal. A group of economists were urging lawmakers to let the tax stand, stating that Congress should take no action to weaken, delay, or reduce the Cadillac tax until and unless an enacted alternative tax change that will more effectively curtail cost growth. In favor of this position is that if repealed, there must be a financial offset to the expected $87 billion in revenue that the Cadillac tax is expected to generate between 2018 and 2025. Regardless, both Democrats and Republicans agreed that the tax is overdue for an overhaul. With more scrutiny than ever before, there was a great deal of warranted optimism that full repeal had a chance. Fueling this optimism was that the Cadillac tax had many opponents, and lobbying groups were capitalizing on that to gain increased momentum for repeal. According to a survey by Morning Consult, three-quarters of Americans were concerned about the tax standards they would like to see repealed or replaced. This was validated by a Kaiser Family Foundation survey that yielded similar results. The imposed emphasized how benefits would be reduced for many by increasing deductibles and other cost share mechanisms like higher out-of-pocket maximums. The Cadillac tax had very little support from those it most directly affects. With more than half of all plans that could be immediately impacted when tax goes into effect, opposition is widespread. Many larger employees, employers and unions successfully negotiated more generous benefits and are discouraged wondering about the impact of losing these benefits. From benefit and most perspective, repealing the tax would go a long way to help protect employer-sponsored health coverage. The repeal of the Cadillac tax had bipartisan support from its very beginning, despite the rest of the Affordable Care Act's provisions mostly divided the major political parties. In fact, it was widely spoken about among most presidential contenders, particularly among Democrats. Both Senator Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton opposed the tax. Sanders opposed the tax since 2009 when he proposed an amendment to the Affordable Care Act to remove it from its original bill. Given the political pressure to act, a two-year delay of the Cadillac tax was included in the year-end budget bill this past December. Many are optimistic that a new president in 2017, the tax could eventually be repealed entirely. So where are we with the repeal of the Affordable Care Act? After withstanding more than 50 repeal votes, the health care law faced a new challenge as 2015 came to a close. House, House Republicans have consistently voted to repeal ACCA either in whole or in part. However, the Senate Republicans have failed to move any of these measures forward. In mid-December, Republicans in both chambers celebrated a small victory as Senate Republicans pushed through H.R. 3762, Restoring Americans' Health Care Freedom Reconciliation Act of 2015, the first act appeal to be passed in the Senate. While this vote demonstrates unified party ahead of the 2016 elections, President Obama made good on his threat to veto the bill. Political strategists now question the strategy will end up helping or hurting Republicans. Had it been put into law, the bill would have, first, repealed the Affordable Care Act's mandates that individuals have health insurance and employers provide it, repealed the Cadillac tax, prohibited Medicare reimbursements for planned parenthood services for one year, and increased the Community Health Center Fund by $235 million a year for two years. H.R. 3762 passed the House on October 23rd of 2015 with a vote of 240 to 189. The Senate approved the bill using a reconciliation process allowing the bill to move forward without the requisite 60 votes. The Senate version of the legislation passed with a vote of 52 to 47, 
and was amended to repeal additional provisions of the Affordable Care Act, including Medicaid expansion, the medical device excise tax, and tax credits given to individuals to allow them to purchase insurance. By leveraging the budget reconciliation process, Republicans forced the President's hand into vetoing the bill. Historically, Affordable Care Act repair, uh, repeal bills passed by the House have died in the Senate, where the Democrat-controlled chamber never allowed a standalone repeal vote. Under the reconciliation process, Senate Democrats were unable to block the vote via filibuster. Politico described the strategy to push for the repeal, knowing that a uh, veto was inevitable by stating that the GOP had big reasons to move ahead with a doomed mission to force the president to veto the bill, to fulfill a promise to its base, and to lay the groundwork to truly repeal Obamacare under a Republican president in 2017. And it's not just optics. Republicans are carefully constructing a legislative strategy based on Senate rules and precedents to make it easier to unravel the health law in 2017 if a Republican wins the White House. Through this strategy, Republicans have carefully delineated the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that would be eliminated first under a Republican president and are doing so with the front of the unified party. The bill also contains provisions that were agreed to on a bipartisan basis, such as repeal of the Cadillac tax. By moving forward with veto, President Obama is going on record rejecting these bar bipartisan changes, which are largely favored by the public. Aside from the posturing, it does open up some express lanes for procedural moves for 2017 environment in terms of what can you do legislatively. The idea was to see how far the Republicans can push the bill on repeal and really set the stage for when there is a Republican president and hopefully a Republican Congress to work together to use reconciliation as a policy vehicle. It will be interesting to see the public's reaction and the impact of the 2016 elections. So, 2016 legisl uh, legislative initiatives. With the Republican-led uh, House and Senate in 2015, we finally saw some movement on a variety of reform bills. Most notably, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act small group expansion provision. We are equally optimistic in 2016 despite a shortened congressional ca calendar as lawmakers take additional time off in a presidential election year. Let's see what bills we continue to track and report on. Access to Professional Health Insurance Advisors Act. This bill amends the Public Health Service Act to exclude remuneration paid for licensed independent insurance producers from the administrative cost for purposes of calculating the medical loss ratio of a health insurance plan. This is commonly to refer to as the MLR Broker Commission Bill. The bill defines independent insurance producers to mean an insurance agent or broker, insurance consultant, benefit specialist, limited insurance uh, representative, any other person required to be licensed under state law to sell, solicit, negotiate, service, effect, procure, renew, or bind policies of insurance coverage or offer advice, counsel opinions, or services related to insurance. Next, Employee Health Care Protection Act. This act permits a health insurance issuer that had in effect health insurance coverage in the group market on any date during 2013 to continue offering that coverage through 2018 outside of a health care exchange established under the Affordable Care Act and treats that coverage as a grandfathered health plan for purposes of an individual meeting the requirement to maintain minimum essential health coverage. Equalizing the playing field for agents and brokers, Brokers Act. In addition to the MLR bill, this act directs the Department of Health and Human Services to establish a toll-free customer service support helpline to enable certified health insurance agents and brokers to seek assistance regarding qualified health plans offered in the federal health insurance marketplace. The bill amends the Affordable Health Care Act to require HHS to make available on the government website for health insurance coverage a list of all certified agents and brokers, contract with the National Insurance Producers Registry 
to regularly ver verify the licensure status of all such agents and brokers and develop a mechanism to enable submission of changes to contact and licensure information. Clearly, support for agent and brokers is a key legislative initiative for benefit mall. The Save Americans Workers Act. This bill amends the Internal Revenue Code to change the definition of full-time employee for purposes of employer mandated to provide minimum essential ESCO coverage on the Affordable Care Act for an employee who's employed at least 30 hours of service a week to an employee who's employed on average at least 40 hours of service a week. This bill has passed the House, but no Senate action has been taken at this time. The Small Business Health Relief Act. This act repeals provisions of the Internal Revenue Code that, one, impose fines on large employers, those with 50 more full-time employees, who fail to offer their full-time full employees the opportunity to enroll in minimum essential benefits coverage, and, two, require large employers to file a report with the Department of the Treasury on health insurance coverage provided to their full-time employees. The bill would also, among other things, deem high deductible health plans to meet essential health benefits coverage requirements. If the enrollee has to establish a health savings account, this works. Amend the Public Health Service Act to repeal the limitation on premium rate variance by age in the individual or small group market. Next, repeal the prohibitions on payments for over-the-counter medications from HSAs, MSAs, and FSAs. Repeal the $2,500 annual limit on employee contributions by salary reduction to a health flexible spending arrangement under a cafeteria plan, and allow a health plan to maintain its status as a grandfathered health plan regardless of any modification to cost sharing, employer contribution rates, or covered benefits. As our final piece, as noted earlier, what's the future of small employer coverage? That is said, the future of our industry is what we're talking about here. With the deterioration of commissions in the individual marketplace, especially those sold via public exchanges, there is a silver lining when it comes to small employer coverage. A few moments ago, I spoke about the changes that the Affordable Health Care Act ushered in both good and bad. However, the segment of the population that has seen the fewest regulatory and legislative changes from the Affordable Care Act may be going through the biggest change of all. While small businesses have been impacted by rating and underwriting enhancements under ACCA, they have been untouched by the employer mandate and its onerous compliance and reporting requirements. Today, there are as many as 30 million, with 96% of small businesses between 2 and 50 employees in our nation. In addition, 54% of these employees provide health care coverage for their, employer, for their employees. I want to focus specifically on the small business owner with two to 50 employees and how they will be impacted by the Affordable Care Act through the balance of the decade. Let's begin with our review by looking at some early predictions of how we expected ACA to impact this small employer segment. Looking at this slide, beginning in the latter part of 2011, Benefit Mall completed a comprehensive study of the group marketplace with a specific focus on the two to 50 employer segment, breaking down the segments further. Benefit Mall's research indicated the following. 25 to 49 employees, this segment will not directly be impacted by health care reform given the lack of penalties and incentives for this particular, this particular group. 10 to 24 employees, little value based on tax credit was expected by this segment, indicating only a moderate decline. However, the segment might shrink in the long term as exchanges are established in favor of individuals. And then 2 to 9 employees, Primary research showed that this segment is more enthusiastic about reform, but still saw little benefits from tax credits, as it would not be a strong enough incentive. Lowering, excuse me, longer term declines could accelerate as low wage workers migrate to federal and state exchanges as individuals. Overall, research indicated there were minimal interest across all group segments in dumping health insurance coverage. As shown in this exhibit, there was little or no difference among small and large employers. 6% of small employers, those are 2 to 49 employees, were likely or highly likely to drop coverage as compared to 4% of all employers with those with 2 plus employees. Clearly, these numbers are 
predicted by Venezuela in 2012 were far less than what most pundits were saying. On the next slide, we're looking at uh, our research further, ask employers who were considering dropping coverage. When did they think it would potentially occur? Of the 6% of employers likely or highly likely to drop coverage, 60% expected to do so in the first few years after the law passed, as seen in this exhibit. As we enter our fourth year of the exchange, it's, possible, it's probably safe to assume that most of this is now behind us. Overall reform was expected to significantly reduce the percentage of uninsured primarily through government programs, especially Medicaid expansion and individual coverage assisted by the individual mandate. This was consistent with our pre-ACA research that further showed that only two to nine and 10 to 24 segments were expected to show any net losses. All other consumer segments, including the 25 to 50 employer market, would experience net growth under healthcare reform. You can see the distribution by segments in this current slide. Predictions we made in late 2011 and early 2012 were meant to be used as a guide for our programs. Our employer client on ourselves and ourselves to navigate through the new world of the Affordable Care Act. As one would expect, the challenging range of outcomes would have differing impacts on each of these constituencies. So reviewing on how much of these performed over the time is important to understand the future direction. The latest Kaiser Family Foundation and Health Research and Educational Trust Annual Survey provides some insight into these trends. First, average family insurance premiums for three to 200 employees rose 12.4% from $14,098 in 2011 to $15,849 in 2014. The average dollar contribution made by employees in these, in these groups grew 11.4% from 2011 to 2014 indicating that employer contributions have remained relatively stable. The percentage contribution paid by employees among all group sizes was 29% for family coverage and 18% for single. These percentages were consistent for both plan types from 2011 to 2014. And as predicted, the percentage change of small business owners offering employee-sponsored coverage was dependent on the employer side. This chart shows percentages for, this, for the years 2011 and 2014 by employer size and strongly parallels what the original predictions assumed. The report further outlined that groups of three to 50 employees, whether they offered coverage or not, saw a slight decrease in the total number of workers covered between 2011 and 2014 from 41% to 38%. The take-up rate defined as the percentage of eligible, eligible employees who left coverage during the same period actually remained steady at 77%. Finally, the number of employees who offered ancillary benefits during the same period grew significantly. For example, 45% of the employers with 3 to 200 employees offered dental coverage in 2011 compared with 52% in 2014. And provision coverage during the same period, that percentage grew from 16% to 34%. Now, while we saw employee sponsored coverage only slightly decline over the past three years, the Affordable Care Act has had a much more significant impact on plans and employers offered. This percentage of covered workers in grandfather plans dropped dramatically from 63% in 2011 to 35% in 2014. As costs continued to climb upward, employers were forced to abandon their grandfather status to keep premiums as affordable as possible. After years of increasing trends to high deductible health plans with saving options, the mix of products purchased by the 3 to 200 employee segment has stabilized with 24% choosing a high deductible health plan option, 13% in HML plans, 46% selecting a PPO, and the remaining 17% choosing a POS plan. One common prediction among industry experts was self-insured plan growth. Instead, the actual percentage of covered workers in self-funded plans declined slightly from 16% in 2010 to 15% in 2014. Nevertheless, there's more to be considered just beyond plan selection. 
Deductibles and other cost-sharing features continue to rise. In 2011, for all firms with three to 200 employees, 50% of the covered workers were enrolled in a plan with an annual deductible of $1,000. By 2014, this percentage has grown to 61% for an average deductible of $1,217. While firms with more than 200 employees are similar rise, only 32% of the employees in these large firms had an average deductible above $1,000 for single coverage in 2014. Now, it is important to note that these deductible amounts are average for all plan types, including HMOs and in-network services, which makes them appear less than what employees may be experiencing. Many industry experts predicted significant declines in sponsored coverage in the 2 to 50 market as a result of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. As the latest research shows, these predictions have been proven false, despite some decreases among the smallest of employer groups. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation conducted a recent study to test these assertions. Like the Kaiser Family Foundation results, there is little indication of erosion in the small employer marketplace. In summary, the report finds that despite early predictions that employers would stop providing employee coverage as a result of the Affordable Care Act, the percentage of workers with offers of assurance from their or a family member's employee and the percentage of workers taking up their employer's office of insurance did not change after the implementation of this health law. At benefit from all, we expect that some of the very smallest employers would seek options in the individual market, which proved to be true. It happened to a lesser degree than we had predicted. And surprisingly, the 25 to 49 market has grown faster than anticipated with even more carrier and plan options for employers to choose from before the Affordable Care Act took effect. The current decline in the percentage of employers that offer coverage has stabilized and might even have reversed somewhat. That is, of course, if we want to test the stability of the market using a single metric that shows this percentage. However, there are so many other variables that influence coverage, not the least of which are average wages, unemployment, regional workforce distribution, plan design, deductible levels, employer premiums, employee cost sharing, so on and so forth. In the 10-year period prior to the Affordable Care Act, the percentage of employers offering coverage ranged between 59% and 69%. In fact, for the smallest of, of these groups, employers with only three to nine employees, the current percentage of those employers offering coverage is statistically similar to what was observed in 2005 and 2006, suggesting that the economy may have played a much greater historical influence than previously thought. But the real threat to employer sponsored coverage may not be the Affordable Care Act with the exchanges and tax credits. It may simply be its cost. Health insurance is expensive because health insurance is expensive. It's all about the health care. We know that the law has had contributory inflation effect on premiums with little opportunity to reduce the overall cost of insurance. The stability of the market with respect to how many employers offer coverage to their employees may be short-lived if better cost solutions are not developed. Now is the time for the industry stakeholders to come together and reevaluate all its options. Among the most probable near-term solutions to reduce the cost are the industry drives toward wellness initiatives. In fact, many organizations are now offering wellness benefits, such as health risk assessments, questionnaires about lifestyle, stress, or physical health, and biometric screenings. In addition, 31% of employers with health benefit programs also offer a financial incentive for employees to complete the assessments, and 28% offer incentive for employees to do the biometric screening. Many employers offer wellness programs that include smoking cessation, weight loss programs, or lifestyle coaching. Of the employers that offer wellness programs, 38% also give financial incentives for employees to participate in or complete the program. These features reduce costs by ensuring employees stay accountable for their own health rather than visiting a physician when an illness strikes. Wellness programs encourage employees to be proactive about their care. 
brokers do play a significant role in identifying the opportunities that currently exist to be certain their small business clients are buying the most efficient and effective plans for their workforce. The debate over whether small employers want to offer coverage in the future has been decided. And the answer is an, outstanding, is an astounding yes. The challenge then is to signing back the exact plan that fits their needs. New technology solutions that allow for more efficient enrollment that help individual plan participants to choose their best, best coverage combined with a plethora of wellness solutions will help to bend the cost curve. Cost containment can no longer be relegated to increased deductibles and cost sharing. There has to be an increased personal accountability at the individual participant level that will drive true results. Only then can we mitigate the cost barrier and continue to see an increase, increasing of number of employers provide their employees access to coverage. For decades, it was common to see group coverage less expensive than individual insurance despite the strict underwriting provisions imposed on individual applicants by carriers. This premise based on the law of large numbers whereby group employers could spread the risk of its rating pool and avoid the anti-selection that often occurred in the individual market. With the introduction of exchanges, this dynamic reversed. With or without advanced premium tax credits, carriers were priced in individual products well below competing small group coverage rates. These group customers were incented via price to drop group coverage by letting their employees move to a low-cost exchange plan. Thankfully, the strategy never took hold and has failed for a number of reasons. First of which, carriers were initially reliant on the risk corridor payment that are to expire now in 2016 to subsidize these rates. Underwriting, underwriting losses were so significant that rates have been pushed well above competing small group rates, causing the strategy to be unfeasible. Next, the population has moved into these exchanges are rarely among those employed by our targeted customers. Most important to consider are the complexities of the individual market still warrant the need for a broker to help navigate the individual through this selection process. With commissions now at pennies on the dollar from pre-ACA levels, many brokers are turning away from the individual market and encouraging their employer clients to stay focused on the group solutions. As individual premiums rise to allow exchanges to become self-sustaining, this is only good news as it further solidifies the small group market choices both on and off exchanges. Now, when we began to develop today's webinar, we started thinking about all the Affordable Care Act has already implemented. Would there be anything left to talk about? Well, it turns out, and obviously from the length of this speech, the answer, the answer was plenty. When this December comes around, 2016 may not be the most eventful year, but brokers and agents know it will have been one of the most critical. With three years of exchange enrollment, we have a better look to answer the question of whether the Affordable Care Act is working or not. How many more co-ops will fail and what carriers will want to participate in exchanges for 2017? How will 2017 premiums look, up or down? Okay, let me reemphasize that. How far up? These are critical questions that will be answered during the coming year. Add to the list that we saw three major policy delays as part of the year-end budget bill. Will these go away eventually or do we start the cycle all over again. Finally, by the end of this coming year, we'll have a new president-elect. What will that mean for the Affordable Care Act? Well, maybe 2016 could be more eventful than we think. I want to thank you all for your time today. I want to thank you for your support of Benefit Mall, and especially want to thank you for your business. It is appreciated. Thank you, and have a great day.